So the, the best way that I've ever been able to sort of encapsulate it without getting into details that probably wouldn't really be appropriate to share publicly is that my deciding to, to continue and go ahead with the prayer service ran a, a very easily acknowledged risk, which was that despite whatever disclaimers were taking place, someone could perceive this as an implied endorsement that basically all faiths believe the same thing. I find it hard to believe that anybody actually watched the service and walked away believing that the Islamic representative believed the same thing as I did or the Catholic priest, but that said, that was the risk. But of course, the risk in not going would be to be perceived as being unloving and uncaring about the needs of the community at such a horrific time. So I decided that the one risk had a better chance of correction than the other. Um, I think it's hard to behave in a way that's seen as unloving and then convince people afterwards that you really are loving. Um, and so I decided to part go ahead and participate anyway, knowing that it would certainly bring some scrutiny and some criticism. Um, like I said in the paper, it's not meaningless to me that when I made the sign of the cross, pretty much everybody there did too. Now, did they have a great orthodox understanding of what that means? Probably not. But in that moment, they wanted to be marked by Christ. And they did it themselves. You know, they, they proved it. They weren't coerced into it. So to me, that, I find that pretty powerful. That on the one hand, I know some people objected to the idea of giving a benediction because it implies a blessing over everything that's happened. And I just don't, I don't view it that way. It was a blessing spoken for the people there. And I think that's how they received it. Because they didn't make as if there were some sign of Muhammad on themselves or some sign of Baha'i on themselves. They all marked themselves with the sign of the cross. So, but even that said, then when all the kerfuffle, because it was, it was February of the following year when things really hit the news, um, Pastor Harrison uh, had asked if I would be willing to write an apology to those within the Synod who had been offended by my decision. And I said, I can't write it in such a way as to say that I believe even at this point that it was the wrong decision, because that's not, that's not the case. I think there's the risk that it could very, be very hurtful uh, it might, you know, assuage some people and hurt others, but where offense is given, the scriptures are pretty clear. You know, we are to, to, to respect the conscience of our weaker brothers and sisters, and so not wishing to imply that I'm the stronger, but if someone was offended by something that I believe we have the freedom in the gospel to do, then biblically it's pretty plain I need to be willing to, to walk with that brother or sister. So I, I apologized. Every newspaper source and everything picked it up. I don't know if you saw it when it happened, but... There was a day, surreal as it was, every website that I have bookmarked on my browser had an article that included me, except the ESPN. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it went, it, you know, it had its 15 minutes because it touched all kinds of cultural hot buckets. I mean, Sandy Hook was, it still is to this day, but at that point, two months later, was still a, a huge news gatherer. The idea of something that would be perceived as religious intolerance, the idea of a, of, a, of a church body disciplining a member of a church body, even though it wasn't a formal discipline. It was just, there were a lot of reasons to believe this is going to catch a lot of news attention. Um, and that required a lot of painful ministry work as well within my own congregation and within the community as people needed to be helped to understand what I was and wasn't doing when I participated, what I wasn't doing, was and wasn't doing when I apologized to those who might have been offended, trying to explain why I could understand those who might have been offended while not sharing that offense. That was tough too. But when I look back on it, and God was gracious enough to give me this viewpoint pretty early on in that process. Because uh, at that point, I was emotionally, you know, I didn't have anything in the tank two months after the shooting. And so, but was realizing, so the risk of not going was to be perceived as unloving. The risk of going was to be perceived as endorsing other religions. The way God guided events by going, no one could say that I had behaved in an unloving or uncaring way or that my congregation had, which of course had to factor in too. If the congregation wants me to be there, that's a different scenario than me just deciding on my own, do I want to go or not? Um, but also then I had the chance to loop back and make absolutely plain this was not an endorsement of any other religion. I believe there is much falsity in certainly the other religions and even other explanations of Christianity. So 
the way God guided events, even in regards to the topic only of unionism and syncretism, I really feel like he managed to make sure both concerns were addressed. Um, that Jesus never had to compromise on whether he was going to be loving or going to be faithful you know, to, to doctrine. And um, I certainly wouldn't say that I meet that standard, but I think he guided events so that no one who's informed about it could believe that it was an uncaring kind of dogmatism which any refrain from participation could be perceived as. There were some fundamentalist Bible churches that refused to participate, and they got some blowback for that reason. You care more about your self than you care about people who are hurting. Well, that's a, that could be used for a lot of bad accusations, but it's one we should do everything to avoid a reasonable application of. Um, but then the flip side being, there certainly were people there who embrace a whatever you believe is fine, it's all the same thing. There were representatives there who participated, who basically said as much, and I disagree with that, and had a pretty public platform to make it plain that I disagree with that too. So, um, had the opportunity to offend people once and then offend the other people later, and uh, <laughs> talk about all things to all people. <laughs> so. But, I mean, that's still just within the umbrella of the unionism and syncretism kerfuffle. I mean, what's, I wish there were some way in good pastoral confidence to write all the different ways that God made it plain throughout horrible, horrible situations that he was not absent. You know, the number of times that I'd be meeting with somebody and a scripture would come to mind and then it would turn out that that was the same scripture that we were doing at that night's service, or that sort of thing. And another thing, a lot of folks don't realize that they got up in arms about my participating in the prayer service. A lot of folks said, well, you should have had your own prayer service. So, well, what do you think happened at my church every night that week? You know, I, I did. We had every night that week, every week that month, every month until the six-month mark, and we had it on the anniversary every year until the five-year anniversary. So we had lots of chances for a very orthodox Lutheran prayer remembrance. But at some point, I'm swayed by Geertz's approach. You've got to be willing to go to where you know the people are. Um, and you can't insist on everything being exactly the way you'd want it to be. This, you know, the same way a combat medic can't demand sanitary conditions. You know, even the, uh, he's no longer in that position, but the gentleman who was the head of disaster response for the Synod at the time, he said he'd been to, you know, however many, literally numberless disasters. He said this was the only time, you know, he wore a collar like I do, that he walked through town and he literally just had total strangers coming up to him asking if he would pray with them. Just because he had a collar on. He said he's never had that happen. He's gone to disasters where he'll ask people if they'd like to pray and they're willing to do it, but he said, he had never had it happen that just walking through town, total strangers coming up asking for prayer. It's like you, you can't sit in your office at that point. You just can't. Um, if it's messy, I'm sorry that it's messy. If people who don't get to see that whole context feel like what happened was something different from what happened, I can try to be patient with that. I share the concern. I mean, hopefully that's pretty obvious. I, I'm not saying unionism and syncretism aren't to be taken seriously or that we should just, you know, I, I really dislike some people say, you know, we should pray anytime, anywhere with anybody. Well, on a one-to-one -one basis, that's true. I can't imagine any person who would come up to me and ask for prayer and I would say no. I don't think that's true of every service that's planned. I don't participate in the town Thanksgiving worship services that take place because they're billed as a unity service and all the different faiths are there and it's a worship service. There's bulletins and there's hymns and there's readings and there's a sermon and there's a choir. It's a worship service. The only way I could participate in that would be to go and to point out all the areas where I differ, which is sort of the opposite of a unity service. So if the only way you can go and be faithful is to be a jerk, it's probably a good idea to stay away. But if staying away can't be reasonably perceived as being anything other than a jerk, then maybe you need to be there. <laughs> so, you know, and in the, worship, in the setting of like a Thanksgiving service, it's a regular annual thing every year. It's going to come up again in another couple of weeks um, as they ramp up the planning. And I'll just need to explain because we'll have turnover in the clergy in the town. And I'll just have to say I can't participate in a unity service. We don't believe the same things. I can't worship in a setting where that's such a strong message or implication. I can participate in, we had a number of, before the shooting, we had a number of like round table discussions 
on various topics. Um, you know, where different representatives of different faiths could be there and say what we would, how we would respond to something from our faith perspective. You know, there, there can be no confusion. You know, when you watch these talk shows on TV and people are arguing at each other, no one says because they're all on the same show, they must all agree with each other. You know, clearly not. But so there's, there's been lots and lots of ways that God has shown his faithfulness. And it's kind of six, we're, we're heading to the six year anniversary and I serve on a couple of committees within the town that are involved with recovery process. I just was in a long meeting on, um, when was that, Tuesday? I think it was Tuesday. And it's, it's challenging now because the differences of how people are affected are so disparate. So you've got some people that not only is daily life pretty much normal, but it really is pretty much totally unchanged from what it would have been if the shooting hadn't happened. And then I work closely with other people who, you know, their child's never coming back, you know, so daily life couldn't be more different. Um, and that's the reality as, as a community. You, know, you have a small number of people who are very, very deeply affected and a large number of people who are very minimally affected at this point. Um, some folks who were further from the center who still are very affected, and some folks very near the center who don't seem to be, if you want to use the word symptomatic or, or whatever at this time, but it, it's a challenge uh, because it's all within the same community. Um, some folks that are deeply, deeply affected and some folks that are, are really not affected at all. And uh, that, that becomes de facto divisive, even if everybody behaves well. <laughs> and we're all human, so. Fortunately, we haven't had any conflict within the congregation itself related to it. In fact, the, 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 the most tenuous time as a congregation and as a pastor, from that standpoint, congregational unity and that sort of thing, it wasn't the shooting, it was the kerfuffle when everything hit the news about the prayer service. That was when there were people who were very ready to leave the synod, leave the church, leave, you know, there were, there were people were angry. Um, and part of my understanding of that, and I understand it too, you know, by the time anybody knew the shooting had happened, it was done, and the perpetrator was dead. There was no chance for anybody to address anything, and the acts, itself, the acts themselves, they're still so inexplicable. Nobody's ever come up with any kind of explanation why this young man did this. Just no clue. I mean, it was his, it was the elementary school he had gone to, but like 20 years previous or whatever, 15 years previous, no trace anywhere in any of his writings that, you know, he had any animosity toward that school. He had attended a number of different schools. I mean, nobody argues he was totally, you know, very, very troubled, obviously, but nobody's got the slightest clue why he did this. So when you have something so inexplicable, and that there's no way to address, and yet that creates so much angst and so much hurt when there's a target. I mean, that's why the gun control debate blew up immediately. I mean, for many reasons, but, but here, well, it's a visible target for all of that emotion um, that really stirs up the anger and the everything in a way that something like, say, mental health treatment doesn't. Um, and within our context here, when there were those within the Synod who were criticizing me, when the president of the Synod was trying to navigate that and understand what he was doing, I never saw him as being a bad guy, but he had asked me for an apology. So when the headline says, LCMS president demands apology from Sandy Hook pastor, well, demands isn't quite right. I could have refused, but they're not entirely wrong well, now even in my own congregation, some folks had a target. You know, they had a, they had a place for a lot of that angst and frustration and pain to land. And uh, honestly, pastorally, that was harder to navigate in terms of just complexity, not in terms of the burden of the emotion by any stretch, but in terms of the complexity of ministering as a pastor when you're still ordained within the church body that some people are now so furious with. Why aren't we leaving the church body? Why didn't you tell him you know, what he could do with his request for, a, you know, for an apology, you know, all of this stuff, trying to pastor people through it. That was in some ways more, it was definitely more complicated. I won't say it was harder. Um, so that's all part of the, 
the thing. And then that kind of went to bed for a while. So this, in a way, my biggest reservation in engaging with this was mostly just, is it going to dredge up a lot of stuff? What's the burden going to be on me? But I thought, well, I'd have the summer to write it, which is a time with a little more space, in theory, anyway. And uh, Yeah, I think so. And I, 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 I'm not blowing smoke when I say I don't always love the tone that's adopted by the ACELC and how they try to address their concerns. But what I really love and will happily praise them for, they sign their name to everything. Every single one, of, and they're, they're right about the areas of difference. I don't always agree with their conclusion about how to address them. But they're right, we need to name the areas of difference, we need to address the areas of difference, and we need to put our name on it. I mean, there's this long history in the LCMS and with organizational behavior background. This whole anonymous lists of who to vote for, that needs to go, that needs to stop. That's not healthy. I have no problem with people wanting to publish lists of who they're endorsing. Put your name on it. Tell me who you are. You know, how do I know that it's not just all the people that, whose names are asking for votes? That's, there's no way that's healthy. And I know there's no way to legislate it to stop, but I would happily, if I knew anybody involved with it, say, please, sign your name on it. Tell everybody else, sign your name to it. It's just so much healthier. I got no problem with you trying to, there's no way for me to know all these various lay members and everything of everything. Tell me who you think is good and why. I'd love to hear that, but I'm never going to listen as long as it's happening anonymously. It's just not healthy. So what I like and why I wanted to support it is I feel like that's what these guys are trying to do. I don't know any of them personally other than, like I said, Pastor McMinn I've interacted with, and then you've seen some of the emails with, uh, with Gary Baker, but I haven't even met them. None of them, as far as I know, have I met in person. But I appreciate what they're trying to do. I think we need more people willing to try to do what they're trying to do. Um, and my hope is that it not turn into an echo chamber you know, where everyone of like mind comes to congratulate themselves on their like-mindedness, you know. So that's where also they had every reason. They could have jumped to the conclusions that I mentioned that some people did. And they, as an organization at least, did not about my decisions. And I, I'm, thankful, I'm thankful for that because I think a lot more went into it than what some of the critics have implied. Um, but I also think it's really not so much... You know, they, they made a really good choice inviting me. That would be awfully egotistical. But they sought out. And then you know, the reason that you had to drive all those hours was because even when I couldn't make it, they really wanted somebody who'd been in the middle of it to have a voice at the table. And that approach, I really respect. I always go back to the Groucho Marx quote about, I don't think I want to be part of a club that would have me as a member. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I really respect the approach. And that's why I feel like it's worth trying to support. And actually, I didn't I don't mention it in the paper, but I worked closely with Dr. Bodhi because I found his paper that I referenced. It's fantastic. And uh, I said, listen, can I, can I send by you my thoughts just so that I can have another set of eyes on them? And, and he was also very passionate in thinking this is the sort of dialogue that you know, unionism and syncretism, he said it's fascinating because in the history of the, the synod, you get lots and lots and lots of published papers and published positions and public debates and so forth until like World War II. And then since then, about unionism and syncretism per se, nothing. Lots and lots of debate about altar and pulpit fellowship, a much smaller amount of debate about prayer fellowship, which in theory might be an umbrella you could include my uh, my decisions under. I don't even consider it prayer fellowship. I have no intention of ever gathering with those same people again for the same purpose. So that to me isn't fellowship. To me, this is a, this is a unique, almost like a chaplaincy kind of situation. Um, but it goes silent. It just goes dark. And I think a lot of it is because it got sucked into the vortex of all the Seminex stuff um, where everybody has their allergies. I mean, I see all of the allergies that's going back to that vortex right now. Not that there weren't issues prior to that and various kerfuffles, but right now, everything is through the lens of Seminex. And it's probably going to take another 30 years before it's not. The problem is, is it going to be... I don't see it happening this way, and it's part of what I really have appreciated about Pastor Harrison's approach, too. You know, 9-11 and Pastor Benke's and Pastor Kishnick's chosen response to that had the potential to sort of be that, and I think in some ways was that, but I see that as sort of like Seminex 2B, you know? 
I don't see a whole lot of guys my age or younger really all that stirred up about it. The way that Seminex still just dominates on the horizon and it's, I think it's just gonna take a little while for the system to filter it out. But I think the ACLC has taken the right approach.